it's always my luck to come after really good speakers. So um, I did take that walk this morning, and I, I realized as you head toward the uh, the golf course, there it's the same path, but at some point it tells you that unless you're a, a golfer, you can't continue to walk. And that's just kind of the same thing that I feel about um, learning at this point. So um, I have this, this attitude within our studios that's really based upon the quote by Isaac Newton that a lot of the stuff that we do um, is based upon some amazing thinkers, uh, especially educators, that's really inspired me to think about the work that we do in a very different way. But I think this quotes also kind of capture um, some pretty amazing um, potential of, of human search for knowledge. And I think that, I think most of you here are educators or, or teachers, and I think this is this tradition um, that's been passed on to us for a very long time. So these two slides um, between um, the, uh, the Hubble um, ultra deep fields and Brian Green from his um, TED talk kind of encapsulate uh, the potential of what we know about um, our existence and the universe in which we exist in that really con continue on the tradition of, of learning and teaching. So this is where I live. This is Batavia, Illinois. Um, the really red dot is actually my house. And it's right next to Fermilab, right? And Fermilab is about to be surpassed by, um, by CERN, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. I thought I would be the only one that talks about this project. But it's a really amazing thing relative to this coalescing of knowledge and sharing and collaboration. Uh, a 27 kilometer uh, ring uh, that's lined with magnet and as Dr. Mitra said last night, they speed up uh, photon into nearly the speed of light collided. And then Atlas is one of this, basically a giant um, digital camera that takes the picture of this collision. And this is what it kind of looked like. So they're searching for the Higgs particle, as he said last night. This is the, the single assumption that allows us to have mass, right? And once they find this, it's basically unified uh, quantum uh, relativity with quantum mechanics. It's a really amazing project. It's been kind of a label as the most sophisticated um, engineering science experiment ever invented by man. But back to the idea of language is here. I make the correlation to the opportunity that we have now. Um, back in the early 1900s, when the father of quantum mechanics, people like Neil Bohr and Heisenberg, were observing um, this, this quantum level, they really didn't have a language to describe what they were seeing. They would literally had to invent an entire language to describe um, this, this kind of um, experience that, that they were witnessing in terms of describing how the universe worked actually at the quantum level. So I think that the opportunity here for us at this junctions of the 21st century, what David Hooley called a threshold decade into the third millennium, is that we now need an entirely new language to describe learning, and with that, an entire new experience. And I choose the word quantum entanglement. Uh, the word entanglement has, has this really amazing um, possibilities and definition to it. Um, there, there is this idea that if you take two objects and you entangle it, and if you move these two objects to the opposite side of the universe, if you do something to the other ones, it's entangled the other one instantaneously react to that measurement. It, it is entangled, it is completely inseparable. And this is something that Einstein could not handle, right? He, he actually used the word spooky. I mean, imagine a guy like Einstein having to use the word spooky to try to explain something that he didn't believe in, he did not believe in quantum mechanics. There was this famous, famous exchange between him and Neil Bohr uh, in which he said that, you know, God does not play dice uh, with the universe. And at one point, Neil Bohr stood up and said, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Um, so what, what we do in our network is try to entangle um, this idea of design and the idea of learning to describe this new language, to come up with a new narrative. Um, I collaborated with Bruce Mao after reading his book, Massive Change, which is radically optimistic in terms of how we see our possibility to solve problems. And together, uh, we came up with our own language called the Third Teacher. And the Third Teacher came from Lord Malaguzzi, who basically was the pedagogist that created the Reggio Emilia um, uh, concept of learning, and in which he said that there are three teachers of children. The first one are the adults. The second one are their peers. The third is the environment. Um, the environment to him is the Third Teacher. 
So we came up with a manifesto um, that really plays all of us in the context. And this is personal to me because I have four kids that are basically following this, that they're entering um, kindergarten and they're graduating in the third decade of the 21st century. And as you can see that we have no idea what's gonna happen two weeks from now, let alone 30 years from now. And they're encountering a world that's filled with challenges but also opportunities. And we end the manifesto with this conviction that together we can literally create a basically a new environment that describe this new narrative about learning and teaching. We talked to a lot of kids. We held actually four design charrettes, talked to a bunch of kids from Toronto, from Chicago, from London, from Munich. We wanted three armatures to really describe um, this process that we were going through. The first one is a beautiful First Nation story that said that generations uh, basically provide this path to the, next, to the next generation. And this path has this metaphor that's lined with strawberries. Basically, it, it is a road that's filled with love. We wanted this research project to be insightful and filled with discoveries. We didn't, want it, we didn't want it a single solution. We wanted an ecology of solutions in terms of what we were um, writing about. And lastly, that we felt that it needed to be incredibly catalytic in terms of the message, and we wanted it to be completely free to the rest of the world in terms of the insight that we were gathering. So idea number one was that everybody can be a designer, to think like one, to solve problems together. And I'm gonna take you through um, just three projects that's under construction and un in the, still in the design process. The first one is the Academy for Global Citizenship. This is a charter school in the southwest side of Chicago that basically serves um, a underserved community, mostly Latino communities. Um, we came together. This is a group of people from very different uh, disciplines um, and, and kind of thinking and we took on idea 41, which is to uh, leapfrog LEED. LEED is a, a standard right now that basically tells you how green your building is. But this is the highest um, sustainable standard that you can think of, which is the Living Building Challenge. We are creating a framework um, that is net positive. So this, this complex actually produces more energy than it consumes. It saves every drop of water that falls on the site. Um, this amazing woman, Sarah Elizabeth Ippolf, started this school when she was 23, and um, she is an old age now of 28, so it's a pretty amazing accomplishment. And they actually do have chickens in this urban context. Uh, a framework um, that basically meets the living building challenge, talk about the quality and the health uh, of the child, place it at the center. It's trying to restore this 10-acre land, 33% of it, to its original state. Um, utilizing uh, the strategy of, of um, geothermal um, orientation, photovoltaics, and um, wind power to basically um, go toward the net positive side. And the kids wanted to see animals and sheep on the top of their school. No double-loaded corridor. Every single space flows from one to the other. It is very specifically designed. But you can see that we're starting to invent a new language. We don't call them classrooms. We call them learning studios. They have design studios to think through um, some of the problems. And they have tinkering studios in order to make and prototype some of their solutions. Unite the disciplines. This is the world that, that we live in every day. Um, this is a private school on the north side of, of uh, Chicago. Um, and all new, all new idea doesn't have to come from new construction. This is a 1929 building that would basically gut the inside. And it's the spaces like this. This is very strategic of placing um, an English classroom next to an art studio, next to a math classroom. Opens out onto this collaborative studios that allow kids to do deeper thinking, uh, to think about solution and to think about how the disciplines and what they're learning is somehow connected and how it's connected to the real world and real problem that's there, that they're doing. The classroom, the idea of the front wall, um, we want that to go away completely. 
Um, this is using Steelcase MediaScape. Um, the teacher or the, um, the mentor actually flow from the center. It is completely an entanglement of environment, furniture, ergonomics furniture, digital media into one single concept. Make it new. This is a new school under construction right now in the southern part of Illinois, and it is, it is a STEM school. And I would say that this is probably the first STEM school that does not have a science lab. But it does have a design studio connected to an art studio. Science and engineering and mathematics happens everywhere. It is pervasive, it is not contained. And what's next for us is really quite exciting. Uh, 50 user experience designing coming together in Chicago in January to solve, um, participate in the idea of homelessness. How do we repurpose streetwise um, to make it more viable as a business for the homeless? Um, to work with ceasefire to attack urban violence. And I'm collaborating with some educator to be basically redefine the landscape of learning in the, in the third millennium. 1%, this is the research that Bruce Mao and, and our group has done to say that um, only 1% of the human population on Earth has access to higher education. So the Massive Change Network um, is trying to double that capacity. I'm invited by Christian Long. I think he's here somewhere. Um, he should actually be speaking here next, next year, but he invited me to participate in a prototype studio, which is basically teaching high school kids design thinking. Inspired by the work of Dr. Mitra, um, this is happening in my hometown. My wife and I are creating um, a, basically a design studio for middle school kids. And we were really scared at the very beginning um, because um, we just were not teachers, we're not educators. But I think that listening to him over the last two years or so and seeing some of his work kind of placed um, um, a confidence in myself that there's nothing that I can do to really screw this up, right? So it's a very, very purposeful experience in the way that we design the space that allow kids to come together to work collaboratively, to solve problems, to play, to discover, to learn, and to change the world. They're going to take our town um, and come up with the strategies to make it net positive, given that our proximity to um, Fermilab and, and the brilliant people that walk through the town, they're gonna learn about quantum mechanics, they're gonna learn about systems and system thinking, rather than think of it as a singular solution. So I end with this beautiful quote um, that Bruce keeps telling me every time I see him, that if you want to go quickly, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Thank you. <laughs>